Hi there. Thank you so much for joining me today, this lovely Friday in Southern California. My name is Julie Hirschberg. I am the owner founder of Reactive Therapy and Wellness here in the Los Angeles area and joining you every week to chat about what we're learning and doing here. And I just got back from Seattle. Um, to film a course for MedBridge. MedBridge is a um, company providing education to therapists and I've worked with them before, great company. And I was able to collaborate with one of my friends and colleagues, Mike Studer, who is really a leader in the field of neurologic physical therapy. He teaches a ton. And one of the things I'm so, uh, lucky to have is that he is a mentor in our group for clinicians for brain bites. And um, so Mike and I collaborate a lot. Um, we've got a lot of good discussions that happen in our brain bites group with him as well. And we were teaching on functional neurologic disorders. Uh, surprise, my favorite topic. Um, and I have been, as you know, immersed in this topic because uh, we're teaching a weekend course coming up in October on functional neurologic disorders and um, updating a lot of the literature. And one of the recent articles that I have read was um, on the pathophysiology, meaning really what is happening in the brain, what do we understand about it, what does that mean for our therapy? And a recent article just came out in Brain last month um, called The Neuroimaging Evidence of Brain Abnormalities in Functional Movement Disorders. So I read that, I've updated, I even included it in our webinar last week, um, prior, off, hot off the press. And what I really loved about this article were several things. So we're gonna dive into it today uh, because you know I love the neuroanatomy, the brain circuitry piece. And we're gonna talk about some of their thoughts um, on one, this deceptive term of organic. So maybe you've heard that before as like an organic disorder or a non-organic disorder, um, this deceptive terminology with that. So we'll talk about that and then talk about the insights from this article on the pathophysiology. So including those things like altered sense of self agency, abnormal emotional processing, impaired top down regulation, and even some of the structural changes uh, that can occur in the brain. So um, let's dive in. Um, one of the first things is to think about what really is central nervous system connectivity. So before we dive into the connection issues, we need to know what is this? This is the title of the course that's coming up for us. Um, and we chose that specifically. But what we think about is all of those connections in the brain, the brain stem, the cerebellum, the circuitry between different areas. And we also think about that in terms of connections to the body, right? Because they're not, it's not separable, right? We can't separate body from brain and, and so on. So when we think about those connections and we think what we think about what we do as therapists, what we really what we're really doing is facilitating or strengthening some of those connections often through the experiences in our body, whether those are sensory or emotion or visual, uh, which is really type, a type of sensation, um, that's how we get information into our nervous system. And yesterday, Mike and I, when we were chatting and teaching together, we talked about this idea, and you've, I'm sure you've heard it before, of neurons that fire together wire together. And that wiring, if you've heard that term, that wiring is the connectivity, is the connectivity in the nervous system. So um, if we think about what we do in therapy, our, our ideas through learning, through practice, through set up, setting up experiences and environment and context and um, graded exposure and rewards and feedback, what we're really looking to do is to change those connections. So when this article that just came out um, 
when it was published and when I started looking at it, what one of the things that I was really struck by is like, let's look at the connections that have gone awry because that gives us a clue into where we need to direct treatment, right? So if the connection's gone awry, we want to direct treatment, particularly at some of those connections. Okay, so let's dive into this article. Again, really love this article. I'll put a link if you're part of our newsletter for, um, for healthcare providers that goes out every Friday, I'll have a link to this article in there. And the authors hit on a few pieces that I really love. One of them is this term organic. And why is it a deceptive term? So the term organic has really been used to, you know, in the past distinguish like a structural problem in the brain from a more functional connected problem. But that's kind of a miswording there because the, the functional problem is also organic. It's, it's not made up, right? And so um, that, that kind of came from that past, that historical past in functional movement disorders that this was conversion disorder or hysteria or something like that. And what the authors talk about in this study, they say, you know, although we haven't found like one unified mechanism, there's not one connectivity issue that is uh, uniform across all FMDs, uh, functional movement disorders. Um, there's a lot of variability. They have found that there's genetic there's epigenetic, there's social influences that contribute to functional movement disorders. And now that they have looked at some of these really truly neurobiological networks that are disruptives, that, that are disrupted, it really uh, recognizes that these abnormalities aren't really distinguishable from what you would call organic. And that that term organic is misleading and deceptive because there are neurobiological changes. So this is really important, I think, in our understanding of functional movement disorders, because again, we're kind of moving away from that history of it being something that was not neurobiological or it was non-organic. It's, it's not uh, organic or not, it's all organic and it's about the connections. So let's talk about the ones particularly in this study that they hit on where there's a connection issue. And I'm gonna go ahead let my dog out of the room um, before he starts barking. So um, we're going to talk altered sense of agency. That's a big one. So there's four big ones that they talked about. Altered sense of agency, abnormal emotional processing, impaired top-down regulation, and, str and actual structural changes for some people. So uh, let's talk about altered sense of agency. This is the, the topic, I think it's really fascinating. Um, one of the things that I think about with this um, is the, the famous police song of like, every move you make, every breath you take, I'll be watching you. Um, when a person has an altered sense of agency, they will, they and their brain will become very, very attentive to what is happening because they're not getting good natural and automatic feedback and, and basically becoming overly attentive. And so the sense of agency is the perception that you have control. In a functional movement disorder, you don't have control and you don't have a perception of control at all. So what they've found in functional MRI, um, studies in functional movement disorders is they see a reduced connectivity from the from the right temporal parietal junction and bilateral sensory motor areas the cerebellum the supplementary motor area and the right insula and this is compared to a group of people that don't have functional um, 
movement disorders. And particularly as this group in the study reviewed the different literature. So they looked at people with tremor and with weakness. They found that these areas, particularly associated with this sense of agency, um, are disrupted. They're different than people with functional movement disorders. Now, one of the things I do want to say, um, and I'll say this about all of these areas, not just sense of agency, we don't know, like this is a classic chicken or an egg, like did these disruptions occur because of the functional movement disorder or did the disruption cause the functional movement disorder? We don't fully know. There's a lot of research that needs to be done. Um, but but basically from those studies, they, they found those correlates with the altered sense of agency. Second is abnormal emotional processing. And they looked at some of the studies that had been done in this area in people with functional weakness, for example, they saw reduced activity in the supplementary motor, act, motor area and increased activity in the amygdala, insula, the posterior cingulate cortices, which are areas of emotional processing. These are not movement areas, right? So reduced, uh, reduced uh, activity in the movement areas and increased activity in the emotional area. And is that actually inhibiting the movement potentially? So these are some of the hypotheses for that. They've also done studies with people with functional uh, weakness, looking at different emotional interpretation and seeing that that is impaired in them. Um, also, they've done studies in functional tremor that further conf confirmed this abnormal emotional processing. So perhaps this is one of the pieces that contributes to the functional movement disorder. And again, it contributes directly, like that circuit, that circuit of emotional processing would influence the movement circuit. So again, this isn't voluntary. This isn't somebody faking the movement disorder. This is actually a brain network disruption causing it. This is what I love about these fMRI studies. Okay, third is that impaired top-down regulation. So here they looked at some of the literature. They had people with functional hand weakness and found that they had decreased activation in their precentral gyrus, frontal gyrus, insula, occipital gyrus, a lot of areas, and the cerebellum while observing the movement. And what they said is that this reflected an impairment of conceptualizing the movement rather than an active inhibition of the movement. So this would tell us there's a problem with that top-down regulation. And they found this in functional MRI, they found it in PET scan. So this is really interesting, right? So this is even with um, the, another study looked at SPECT imaging where they had external stimulation in people with a sensory motor impairment and they found decreased blood flow in the contralateral, that's where our sensory information would go to, contralateral thalamus and basal ganglia. And it normalized with, um, with the hypoactivation actually normalized with a symptomatic improvement, suggesting that the pathology might be attributed to impaired projections between the frontal cortex and the basal ganglia. Very interesting with that change that you could see with sensory stimulation. This is why we test the sens sensory system and why we would incorporate it into treatment. So finally, I want to talk about number four, the structural changes, because this is where like you got to throw the term organic out the window if there's actual structural changes. Now, again, these are not diagnostic. Nobody's doing an fMRI or a PET scan or spec, any of that to, to diagnose. These are findings that they look at over, you know, um, in a group of people with functional movement disorders, but we don't know causation. Right? So again, we don't know chicken or an egg. 
So here they um, looked at some of the studies where MRI actually detected changes um, in size of brain areas associated with emotional processing. So this again with functional weakness. Um, they found increased volume in the amygdala, striatum, cerebellum, uh, the thalamus, um, and so, but also increased size, but it didn't correlate with the duration of the severity of the disease. So that's really interesting. Honestly, they're not sure what to make of that, um, to be honest. Um, and so if we are seeing some of the changes in the size of these, potentially because neurons that fire together wire together and they're increasing in size, this may point us to also then what we might pinpoint in an intervention. All right, so obviously this was this was a review of the literature from from just recently, just from 2021, last month. And there's a lot of diversity in the literature. They're small sample size. It's really hard to reproduce it. So this is just the beginning. This is not, as I said, diagnostic tools at this point. This is just the beginning of a, us beginning to understand what's happening in the brain with these connections. Um, but we don't know cause and effect. So especially because in functional movement disorders, we can have such differing presentations. They can look like Parkinson's, it can look like tremor, it can look like weakness. It's going to take a lot of research for us to really drill down to what is the underlying um, cause. But I think bottom line is there's growing evidence to show that there are neurobiological, neurophysiological changes in functional movement disorders. The functional type imaging, the newer imaging have helped in us in this understanding um, in key areas of the brain, um, hypoactivations in some areas, overactivation in other areas. And this should really help us out when it comes to what we might want to look at and investigate and assess in the person with FND and then where we want to help people in treatment. I think it really underscores the interdisciplinary team approach because it's a lot of connectivity between things and it underscores our pie chart or holistic approach of really looking at people um, and their whole entire nervous system. So, um, so that's really what I wanted to share with you today. Again, join our newsletter so you can get that update um, from all of these articles that I'm sharing every week. I'll put that in there. I'll remind you too, we have a weekend course coming up in October. Actually, it's more than a weekend course because we have several things dripping out already to get you some background, um, becoming that mindful, therapist and understanding the autonomic nervous system and understanding the sensory system and uh, motor control principles to lead up to the course. So that is, um, that's available and it's coming up October 9th and 10th. Also coming up is our Brain Bites uh, community. This is a mentorship community for people who love this, the complexity of the brain, the complexity of the nervous system, and tying it to a person's body and really wanting the support and collaboration with other therapists. So our group is opening up in October. We're keeping it really small so we can keep that mentorship really intimate. And um, I'd ask you join our wait list if that's something that you're interested in because we likely will only open it up to our wait list this year. Um, finally, we, this course, the weekend course that's coming up, the Cultivating Central Nervous System Connectivity course, we are going to do a giveaway and give away one of those courses for free. That's going to start today, so you'll have to check out our Instagram feed for that giveaway and, um, and get on it. Let's give away a course for you. So check that out today, September 24th. It's going to go through next Monday as well. But as always, thank you so much for joining me today. I so love this community and learning with you. And uh, thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend.